Hello, welcome. Thanks for being here. Let's get rolling. We're going to do this really quickly so we can all run upstairs and catch the, the keynote. I've been anxious to see it. Um, all right, so developer CEO, start your own company. What is this talk about? This talk is about uh, planting some seeds in your brain. It's really about a beginning a journey. And I don't have a lot of time today, so it's really, I want to go through some tips and tricks, just some things to think about as you consider becoming an entrepreneur or you're already an entrepreneur and you want to think about you know, creating a company or going to the next level, um, what that looks, for, looks like for you. And why should you care what I have to say? You know, who is this guy on stage? Uh, my name is Chuck Liddell. I am the CEO of an ISV called Valence. We have an integration product. We're doing native integration on Salesforce. And uh, we came out of a services company called Capuhonu that's been in the ecosystem for about seven or eight years uh, doing sort of complex things. Talk about that a little bit more. Before that, I did hardware, oddly enough. I had an ice and water vending machine company I was part of. And we did a machine-to-machine -machine network globally before machine-to-machine -machine was cool. Uh, it didn't work out very well because no one really cared about IoT back then. Um, OK, so this is a short talk about a complex subject. So I'm going to say right up front that I'm using some sort of simple language, but that businesses are inherently complex and sort of fickle creatures. Uh, so you know, your mileage may vary. Uh, definitely seek out great advisors and partners that can give you sort of recommendations and, and leverage people's experience uh, as you go down this path. So who are you? Um, you are a, an employee, a freelancer. You could be a developer, an admin, a, a business person of some kind. But what I hope that you have is a, a spark of some kind, a, a degree of passion. And you're craving something more than you have today. Maybe that's a, a more flexible schedule. Maybe that's a creative control over an idea or a passion that you have. Or maybe it's just financial. You want to make some, some money uh, starting a company. But you need to have that sort of inner drive because this process is not easy. And there'll be dark days and tough moments, and you can rely on that, that sort of spark to keep, get you through those times. Um, so you need sort of that yearning to get started. So let's be really basic here. Why does a company even exist? Why does a company succeed at all? And the answer is that they have something that differentiates them. They have something that they provide or do that other people want, that they want to spend money on. Um, and that differentiator could be very simple. Uh, maybe you go to the grocery store closest to your house because it is the closest store to your house. And that is what they did to get your business. Or maybe you drive past that store to a different store because they have better prices or better customer service or better quality food. Um, and that's their differentiator that made you go be their customer. Um, so the secret to, to a business is figuring out what is your differentiator, what makes you special in your market and uh, gives you an advantage over your competition. Um, and that is your first step that you need to do when you're starting a business, is figure out what makes you special. What's your special sauce? As soon as you figure that out, um, you need to figure out all the things that go beyond that. So one of the ways that I think is a, a good way to figure out your differentiator is sort of coming from a place of frustration, oddly enough. So we started our integration products because we were irritated by how many times we had to reinvent the wheel and build custom code to do connections between Salesforce and other systems. We did these projects over and over and over for other people, building these connections, and then we thought, there has to be a better way to do this. This is super frustrating that I have to keep reinventing every time. There has to be a better way, and we decided to go make a business and build it. Um, and I find that that sort of, not, not anger, but frustration with something is a really good motivator to go change a problem that you see because it means that you have firsthand experience with the problem such that it actually affects you emotionally, and you have a sense of how you would change it. Um, and this passion, this sort of drive, is really important because you're never going to be the biggest team. You're never going to have the most money. You're probably not the smartest team. So how are you going to beat your competition? And the answer is that passion, that drive. There's something inside you that you're sort of, you can't stand by and see something happen. OK, so you figure out you know, what your passion is and how you're going to differentiate, the very next step, and this is not an easy one, is to explain it to people. You know, you're at a conference like Dreamforce, people say, hey, what do you do? You know, what's your idea? And if it takes you 10 minutes to explain it and they still don't understand what it is, then you've failed. Uh, it's, it's no good if you can't articulate what it is. Um, and this is not easy. It takes a lot of practice. You have to think about it. 
and how to distill it down into the, the core essence of what you're describing. I was terrible at this for a long time and probably still not very good at it. Uh, with my services company, we were a small team of very talented engineers. We did a lot of complex architectures. We did integrations. We did community cloud stuff. We did crazy like PowerPoint on top of Salesforce stuff. And as a developer, I hate to speak imprecisely. And so when people say, what kind of stuff do you do? I say, oh, we do everything. We're very capable. We do, we do hard stuff, complex stuff, uh, which is technically true. right? I, I hadn't left anything out, but it was also not very helpful. right? I didn't really teach people about what we were capable of doing. And it's very hard for them to sort of walk away from that conversation having a sense of who we were and what we could do. Um, so figuring out how to even explain your product or your idea is a challenging step, but you just spend a little time focusing on it. OK. So another mistake that people make is thinking that they have to come up with the next big idea. Um, your business, your idea doesn't have to be massive or, or world changing. It, t most businesses tend to be sort of iterative improvements over something that's happened before. So I use Scott as an example, um, oddly enough. As, uh, so Scott works on Illuminated Cloud, which is an IDE. Uh, sorry, it's an extension for IntelliJ. And Scott didn't reinvent IDEs. He just said, hey, the IDs that are in the ecosystem aren't that good. I could do better. I'm going to iteratively improve it and add some things that are important to me that I think should exist. And he's doing really well, and people are paying attention to him. Um, but it's, it's a better mousetrap. It's not a totally revolutionarily different thing, but it's valuable, and people recognize that value. Um, and a lot of good businesses start this way, right? OK, so let's talk a little bit about team. The, a decent rule of thumb, and this is a little bit simplistic, is that there are three H's you need on a team. You need a hipster, a hustler, and a hacker. And these break down as sort of your, uh, your hipster is a, a, a design thinker, right? They're designing a product, or they're designing an experience for a customer. You're sort of managing a customer experience, maybe as a services company. Um, your hustler is the one making phone calls. They're getting out there. They're here at Dreamforce going, and they have 200 business cards at the end of every day this week, right? They're out, just out there hitting the streets, talking to people, making it happen. And then your hacker is sort of behind the scenes putting stuff together. They're, they're writing code. They're working on product. They're doing uh, consultations with the customers. Um, it's sort of a, the, the trio that a successful company can be composed of. Again, a little bit of a simplistic way of thinking about it. Another way to think about it is the sort of thing with the, the domains of the business that need to be handled. Um, I've broken it down into five here. There are different ways that you can slice this. But basically, you have someone that's thinking about what the business is going to be, someone responsible for delivery. So if you're a services company, they're sort of managing um, the projects and helping people to, to get some value out of that. If it's a product, maybe they're building the, the code and, and running the team building the code. Um, sales, sales and marketing. Um, operations and finance, right? the backbone of the business. If you have a good delivery team and a good sales team, but you can't run your books, you can't really have a successful company. Uh, and then finally, customer success, really important. Sort of make sure that whatever your customer is, whether it's a, a contract you're doing with a, a customer client or it's a customer buying your product, um, you want to make sure that they're having a really good, good experience. And you can cover these domains in different configurations, right? So here's a scenario. I've got my two founders, Kate and Chris. And Kate is sort of a, a people visionary, right? Um, Kate has the idea for what the company is going to be. Kate's out there doing talks, uh, talking to the world, proselytizing, doing interviews, um, talking to customers, making sure all the customers are really happy. Very sort of people-oriented founder with the vision. And then Chris is supporting Kate behind the scenes and doing everything, right? Delivery and operations and actually building the, the product or doing the services um, and managing sort of the infrastructure and the team. You have the same two founders you know, configured differently. Now, Kate's more of a product founder, right? Kate is uh, still doing the vision, but behind the scenes almost, working on delivery, interacting with customers and clients in a delivery capacity, right? Validating what, what she's building. And now Chris is sort of the outward facing person and doing sales and also doing the books and the operations, but is sort of the public face um, in a way that, that Kate was in the prior configuration. So th these are both fine. These, these two configurations are successful businesses as long as these are being covered and these people have enough time to take care of these different things. So I hope that starts to get the gears turning, a, a sort of what makes sense for you and what you like to do and what you're good at, um, and also what you're missing. So we're going to talk about that um, in a minute. So we talked about the, the three H's and we talked about sort of domains. So really, I'm going to take it down even simpler for you. There are two jobs in a company. Just two. The first job is to create value. I build a product, or I'm a great consultant, or I, I have something that people want. 
And the other job is to sell that value. Let people know that you exist. Let people know that this is your product, this is your service, and generate interest in it, get a check for it, and then the other person that's creating the value delivers, right? If you can do these two things, you probably can get a company going. If you miss one of these, it's not going to work out. All right, so time out. There are things that I'm not good at, just really not good at, and there are things that you're not good at. And you need to be honest with yourself if you're starting a company about what you're not good at. And don't let pride or naivety allow you to think that you can do it all. Um, admitting weakness is actually a strength in this case because it means you can plan against that weakness. You can find partners that complement you and are good at the things that you're not. You can hire people to fill in your weaknesses. You can get, you can get advice or you know, hire services. Um, being honest about what you're good at is the most important thing you can do as you start the company. And uh, one of the things, if you're a developer, if you're a very technical person, you need to be thinking here is, am I the CEO or the CTO of my company, right? Am I going to be an a extroverted, garrulous public speaker, or am I going to be sort of in the back working on tech? I always have tech problems. I got to get rid of this laptop. Um, so or am I more of a like, behind-the-scenes kind of person? And both can be successful roles, right? You can be a CTO of an incredibly successful company. You can be a CEO as well. Um, it's really about finding the right partners. So kind of as we get rolling here, um, a few pointers. The first is don't quit your day job yet. And really, this is about MVP, right? It's about doing something uh, as efficiently as you can because your time, your money, are finite resources. So you want to validate your ideas, you want to get traction, spending as little effort as you can to get them. Um, a really efficient way to do this is to have a conversation, right? If you're thinking about building something, talk to 100 people about it and say, here's what I'm thinking about building, what do you think? Before you write a single line of code or do a single diagram. And then do a, a picture of it, don't write any code, and say, here's what it might look like, what do you think? Right? And then tear it up and draw another picture. Right, Every step of the way, try to spend as little of your resources as you can to validate your ideas. And that allows you to pivot and make changes. If you put a lot of time and money and effort into something before you really know if it's going to work out, and then it doesn't, you may not have any more second chances to try to pivot or change. Um, so start small. Start having conversations with people. And then as it grows, there will naturally be a point where you realize that it's time to go full time on this or get a loan from somebody to really focus on it or, or take that next step, it'll be fairly obvious when that happens. Uh, it won't be a surprise. So start small. OK, how, how do you find money to, to fund a business? A lot of people think that you need venture capital. Um, that is a, a false thinking. Um, a lot of people, most companies start out with either savings or you know, credit card or a small bank loan or friends and family. Uh, and that tends to be enough. You, you, if your company, if you're doing an MVP style, if you're going slowly and, and going small at the start, you're not going to be spending a lot of money to get going. And hopefully, you'll start to see some returns pretty quickly, and you can kind of grow it organically. Um, this is a whole talk all by itself. So what I've done is there's a link at the very last slide that has a video you should watch about how to raise money for a business. Awesome video, very helpful. Um, definitely give it a watch. OK. So, uh, we talked a little bit earlier about are you a CTO, are you CEO, what are your strengths, and more importantly, what are your weaknesses, and how do you mitigate those? Uh, finding the right partners to work with is very valuable to you, right? You've, you've been honest, you know what you need. Um, you know, this is the, let's say you, you're a founder, but you're not very extroverted, so you need someone that has that sort of just silver tongue that's going to get out there and work the crowd and talk to people uh, to partner up with. But I, I caution you to choose wisely. This is not a, a light decision to make, especially for another founder that's going to help you start a business. You need to make sure that you can trust them, that they're in it for the right reasons. And I would rather see you start a company sort of understaffed, where you're doing a little bit too much yourself, than choose the wrong partner early. Um, so Because then you know that you're small, and you can sort of be appropriately ambitious. One of the worst things is starting off with a bang and trying to go big and bite off more than you can chew, and then realizing that you have the wrong team. Um, so I've seen that happen a lot to people. Take your time choosing your partners, but make sure that you find good ones, and you do need them. You probably can't do it by yourself, so you have to sort of pay attention to this step. All right. So you followed my advice so far. You found some partners. You found a differentiator. You're pursuing your idea. You're starting it off as an MVP. You haven't spent a lot of money on it. You're socializing it. 
And now you have a company. You formed an LLC, you've got a business card, you came to Dreamforce, started to pass it around. <laughs> what do you do now? Where do you go from here? Um, so a couple things, more sort of pointers, aphorisms. Um, you're going to be getting a lot of different perspectives. People have all kinds of ideas about how to run businesses, about how to run your business. Um, listen to everyone. Uh, seek counsel, have advisors, read books, uh, ask questions. But at the end of the day, it's your call. This is your business. This is your life. You're trying to make something happen. So believe in yourself and believe in your team and just make the decision. Um, as you build a business, more and more, you have to make quick decisions without a lot of information. And you have to live with those decisions. So just make them and, and deal with the consequences, good or bad. Uh, over time, you'll get better at making these decisions. And it's really the way you have to operate as you start to move into this kind of entrepreneurial endeavor. Um, if you hired good partners or if you've hired good early employees, then you should believe in them and trust them, delegate them, give them a chance to have a positive impact on your business. Believe that they're there for the right reasons and give them some autonomy to, uh, to help you to be successful. You really need a team uh, that you can rely on. In addition to that, keep it simple. There's a great sort of saying that I like that if the first version of something that you ship, you're happy with, you ship too late. The first version you put out there is going to be ugly. It's going to have warts. You need to get it out there, get some validation, get people looking at it and playing with it to give you a sense of where you need to go from there. Also generates a little bit of traction, helps you with financial negotiations if you're trying to raise money, um, helps you knowing where you need to go next. So starting out small, keeping it simple, getting something out there, and then continuing to iterate from there. This is just as applicable to a services company as it is to a product. Um, start with what you know. Maybe you're really good at community cloud. So start out, hey, we're a community cloud shop. This is what we do. We're going to look for just community cloud projects. We're going to do them really well. I'm going to find three customers that love the communities that we built for them. They're going to go tell people how awesome we are. And that's the beginning of my company. And then I'm going to grow from there into other domains. I'm going to staff up and go after other types of projects. You know, but you need to start small. Always be humble and be hungry for knowledge as you go. You're going to get better. You're going to get smarter. You're going to become more capable. Don't forget that there is a lot that you don't know. And you need to read books. You need to go to conferences and listen to smart people talk and ask lots of questions. Um, and just constantly be trying to absorb as much information as you can and then taking that and reapplying it back into your decision-making process that you have. Um, and then finally, this is something that is near and dear to my heart. Um, if you know me personally, if you try to interact with me, uh, you can only find me on a Tuesday or a Thursday. I will not take a meeting with you on a Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. And the reason for that is I protect those days for internal work with my team and for deep work, right? So I'm, a, I'm an architect, I'm a technical person, and I found that my schedule was being chopped up so much with meetings that I could never really focus on my passion, which was creating my company, building my idea, and unless I got really solid blocks of contiguous time to be quiet and focus and do hard work, um, I was sort of, I had stalled out and I wasn't making a lot of progress. So I started chopping up my schedule and say, okay, Tuesday, Thursdays for the public, I'll take public meetings, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, nobody can talk to me, you can't find me. Um, it's a little crazy sounding perhaps, but uh, it works out really well and people respect it. No one's really had any trouble with it. You know, uh, customers of ours understand that that's the way it is. If they have an emergency, of course, I'm always available. Um, and that's how I found a way to protect my time. But if you're the kind of person that's capable of starting a company, then you have some passion, you have some creativity, and you probably experience flow. You probably experience the ability to do deep work and get in and just get stuck in on something and make sure that as you get rolling and you get caught up in all the craziness of running an actual company, that you don't lose sight of that core ability that you have that makes you special and give, your, give yourself a chance to, to pursue it and have that excellence. All right, as promised, I have some, uh, some links up here. So I've got a link for a great slide deck you should look at. It's just got some good tips and tricks. The money video I mentioned. And then I'd like to call out this book, uh, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. It's a book about being a CEO and making tough calls. Um, when I read it, it scared me. It made me nervous that I wasn't perhaps capable or ready to be a CEO. And it also made me decide that I didn't care and I wanted to be a CEO anyways, that I was capable, that I had the ability to learn what I needed to learn, and that was something that I wanted to pursue. But it was a wake-up call for some of the challenges of running a company, um, and I encourage you to read it if you're giving this serious consideration. Um, I kind of killed all the time, but I'll take a, a few questions uh, if, you, if you have any. All right.
I did this talk on my, oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay, uh, so it's a question about if I ask 100 people about my idea and I tell them about it, how do I know they're not going to go try to start the same business? Um, and this is a common misunderstanding, which is that your idea is what's valuable. Your idea isn't that valuable. Execution on your idea is what's valuable. Um, you can tell 1,000 people about your idea, but if you have something special, then they may not be able to accomplish it, right? Uh, so don't be afraid to talk about what you're doing. Um, because just by articulating, it's very rare that just the concept of what you have is so special that by revealing it, someone else is going to go be able to accomplish it. It's the passion and putting the team together and the drive. Um, and you're, you're so, perhaps some risk when you share, but your potential advantage of knowledge gain, feedback, validation far outweighs that risk. And it's always worth getting the idea out there and talking about it. Good question. Is it more fun working for yourself? Um, it is absolutely more fun working for yourself. Uh, it gets a little scary when you have a team that works for you and you have to make payroll and you're worried about you know, their families and your family. Um, but I wouldn't trade it. It really, it's so rewarding. Um, and I'm someone that loves sort of creative control and I, I want to be able to sort of shape, shape vision. Um, so if you have any inclination that this is for you, I encourage you to give it a shot. You can start small, just be a freelancer. You don't need, necessarily need a team to just get started and kind of play around with this. What's the biggest challenge I face when you set up the company? Um, it's incredibly easy to set up a company. You form an LLC in about 10 minutes, you print some business cards, and you're done. Um, what ends up being challenging is, uh, I think, trying to engage with the world and find people that are interested in what you're doing. Uh, it helps if you have some sort of channel already, like if you're known in a space. Um, or you have some network of people that you can leverage. If you're going totally cold and you have an idea but no one knows about you or your idea, that can be super challenging. Um, and that ends up being the really hard part. The hard part's usually not the execution of the idea, it's getting the world to care about it. Um, and that's a super big challenge. That time for... Any more? All right, good. Thanks, guys.